So now I can introduce Chris, who's been standing patiently. Uh, he's our Solution Centre Manager for Small Pools and has been, of course, has the honour of being our inaugural 20 speakers. So first of all, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'll just put my mic back on so I don't cause any more feedback for Nikki. Um, so I have the dubious history of being one of a collaborative team that's probably developed the world's smallest subsea tieback field. So that makes me an expert in that area. So I wasn't going to recite my work history or my CV or any of that stuff, but you can probably get that from our um, web page, a little bit of our bios. Okay, and okay. tell us what you're going to talk about today, Chris. Yeah, today is, it's a um, small, small title, big topic. So what we want to focus on today is really, um, and ask the audience a question, do you feel that there's an imperative to integrate renewable energy with oil and gas? That's actually the first piece of work for the day. So if you want to sh a show of hands, would be appreciated. Okay, there's maybe two thirds of the audience think that. So I obviously get to see who put their hands up and who didn't. So I get to decide at the end when I ask you the same question, perhaps if I've convinced anybody else in the room. That's the intent. All right. Okay, Chris, over to you. You've got 20 minutes. Thank you. Feedback not allowing. Right. Um, wh what we're going to do today is sort of set some context for marginal fields. What are marginal fields? What are small pools? Then we're going to talk a little bit in, in, with that in mind from context point of view. We're then going to talk a little bit about some of the themes that we're working in the Oil and Gas Technology Center. And with that, we're going to drill down a little bit into renewable energy. The format is, as Nikki said, sort of 20 minutes chat for myself, a little bit longer, a little bit shorter would be fine. And then open the floor to questions. And what we might do is reverse some of the question and answer session, and I'll do the questions. And you guys can do the answers. We'll see how that goes as we go through it. For those who don't know, the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, funded by both um, Edinburgh and London, tune of 180 million guaranteed funding over the next decade or so. We're organised in a number of themes, including TechX, accelerators, etc. We're also organised across five solution centres. The solution centre today, host, your host of the day, is marginal fields, small pools, and really the context for why we have that solution centre is the commercial imperative. Roughly speaking, the UK has around about 350 marginal fields. These are discoveries that have had some form of appraisal engineering, appraisal drilling, et cetera, that have been carried out. Bar barrels, three and a half billion barrels of oil, valued to the UK, around about 135 billion sterling. So the, the small in name, large in nature. Where are they sort of um, produced? From our point of view, the, working with the OGA, we presented last year at the uh, Technical Forum in support of the Oil and Gas Authority for the 30th round. I'm going to have to turn my back a lot on you a, a lot of the time. I apologize for that. It's just the nature of working with the screen. The marginal fields are quite close to infrastructure. 70% of those fields are small, less than 10 million barrels. 70% of them are within 25 kilometers of existing infrastructure. So you can see the opportunity is twofold. One is the new resource, but the other one is extending the life of the oil and gas um, economy, if you like to think of it like from the UK, the ecosystem that is oil and gas, along with the uh, maximizing economic recovery. The tool we're using is Shark Cloud. It's really just a storyboard or a storytelling system. I obviously walk up and down the screen to distract you as much as I can as we go. Um, but, but it's a very easy way to talk to our themes, talk to what we're about, and also talk to our aspirations, and then we can hang content off. It doesn't matter if it's embedded video, etc. It's quite powerful from the point of view of telling the story in a clear and concise way. You can judge me on that in the feedback later. Our aspirations in order to realize that commercial opportunity, we see that rapid tiebacks, and tiebacks are single or double wells, et cetera, manifolded, tied back through production tubing, pipelines on the seabed, control umbilicals, et cetera, that hydraulically and remotely operate those wells and control them, tied back to existing infrastructure that could be fixed, fixed platforms, floating in terms of FPSOs, or tied back into further subsea systems and exported to the floor. <coughs> The aspiration is to halve the cost and do it in half the time, get half them under development by 2030, and by no stranded assets, really what we mean there is there's no technical reason why you can't develop that piece of infrastructure, that asset. We can't help you prioritize your capital investment, but what we can do is make sure there's no technical barrier that would stop you from um, developing that asset. In order to meet those aspirations, we've defined some areas which we just called high-level objectives. We're looking at new development options. We're looking at improved recovery. 
One way to make a more small field more economic is obviously to double the recovery factor. If you're only going to get 20 or 30 percent out of the oil in ground, then one thing we can do is using uh, research bacteria, enhanced lift, other systems we can then pick up. Excuse me, I'm going to take some coffee. Um, pick up more oil. I've got a bit of a cold this week, so if I sound slightly denser than usual, you're going to uh, you can uh, excuse me. This is the stuff we're after. Um, this is actually a sample. Um, from the Bewley field, which was um, developed collaboratively with uh, Talisman 15 years ago. That field was roughly speaking 3 million barrels recoverable. It was done in a very simple way using hydraulics only. We came up with a system, as we talked earlier about the umbilicals. This is the sort of umbilical that we can use. And again, I just pass that around. Um, the comments were from the project team, not from me at the time. Um, but it was a hydraulic only, effectively a garden hose bundle, which is armored that gets laid on the seabed. That's the technique. Many of you in this room will know this much better than I do, but obviously for a wider audience, we're trying to make sure we communicate across that sort of breadth of audience. Some of the umbilicals become more complex. This was one that we did with BP a long time ago. The cores in the middle, those are all the power cores. That's where the energy gets transferred, the comms, etc. The steel tubes are for uh, methanol, for instance, to help as, um, assist the flow assurance piece, along with other systems around. I'll just pass those around if you don't mind. So as I said, those are the high level objectives. For context, these are small fields. In order to realize those objectives, there's another sort of step down that we go into. And as we've just talked a little bit about reservoir technology, some of the issues, onshore processing, one way that we can make um, small fields more economic is cluster a few together. The outer Murray Firth is a great example of this. Um, there's quite a lot of infrastructure in close proximity to marginal discoveries. So if we clump three or five of these things together, we can make an economic argument that suggests that we should then go and develop them. So with this high-level aspirations, these set of key objectives, one of the themes uh, my colleague Graham Rogerson, who's not in the room today, came up with was tie back of the future. And this was really imagining what does the future subsea tie back look like? Again, the shark cloud shows the connectivity. It shows that if we work with fishermen and advanced flow management, we held a call, an open call, a million pound call, open innovation, give us your ideas for higher degrees of interconnectivity, bringing a sort of USB type approach um, to, to subsea infrastructure. And really the, all that means is having a common set of standard interfaces that we could work to. So in the competition, Around last year, we presented the initial findings, phase one findings at the technical forum in support of the Oil and Gas Authority's 30th licensing round. When Graham and I first talked about it, we looked at a number of themes that we could develop that we could see would have a commercial impact. One of them is a circular economy, and we can talk a little bit about that later on. But that's really moving things into a, a, a circular, a, from a circular framework rather than a linear framework. So we don't just design, build, use, dump. That's not the intent. What's building into that sort of concept is that we can circ circulate through the economy, generate more economic benefits. So we came up with a concept which is really talking around design for disassembly, not decommissioning. And that means there's a residual commercial value that some of these small fields will only have th short lives, three or five years. At the end of that period, you recover the equipment, recondition it, and then redeploy it on the next discovery. That's one way to get the capital recovered over multiple jobs but also realize a, a lower capital requirement for the first, um, first development. So through this piece, this shows that all the companies who got involved in the competition. Oops, I'm just going to go back one talk. All the companies who got involved in the competition, out of them in totality, I think there's 25 different companies. Oops. I get to be the first always. Yeah, so we had 25 companies, 15 proposals, six integrated studies. And again, just talking about the commercial impact of that, phase two is now up and running. We have a bit of a roadmap. Part of the benefits is obviously carbon dioxide saving. We can do it in half the time for half the cost, which is of interest to ourselves. Wood Mackenzie had a look at the work that we did and also co-presented last week at Subsea Expo. So they looked at 
the marginal fields. They have their own data set. They looked at where they are. This graph really shows the close proximity to other fields, the number of fields in central Graben, et cetera. They have their own view and slice on the data. So the numbers are all slightly different, but the intent is the same. All of these are challenged, and there's reasons why they're challenged. There might be um, geography, there might be partner agreements, there might be technical reasons in terms of reservoir complexities. But they estimated that in their informed view, the tie back to the future has already added another 400 million barrels that make them economically sanctionable. Roughly speaking, that's another 4 billion of value. So smaller name, challenging in nature, but huge commercial impact. And the Time Back Features is not a one thing. It's, it's a suite of programs that we're running that can have a significant impact. Another key element from that commercial impact, global export. Only 25% of marginal fields are in the UK CS. So that means 75% are elsewhere. There's a huge potential for technology that's developed that's aligned with delivering these marginal fields in terms of export potential. So what role do um, marine, offshore marine renewables play in that? A number of themes. We met, must be a year or so ago, offshore renewable energy catapult down in Glasgow. It became a key theme for ourselves, and as the logo says on any integration there, um, we're, we're totally agnostic to the technology. We don't mind if it's wind, fixed or floating, all kinds. Don't mind if it's wave, tide or current. We don't mind who produces it, uh, an ECOG in the room, which is uh, one of the, this is one of their um, devices, and we'll talk to that in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but we are truly agnostic. We don't mind if it's wind, wave, tidal current. If we shed the umbilical, and some of the umbilicals that were passed around in the room earlier, if we can shed that, we reckon, roughly speaking, <coughs> for every 100 pools, there could be a billion-plus capital saving alone just by doing away with the umbilical. That doesn't mean we've got it in for umbilical manufacturers, not at all. They're making a good living at the moment in the offshore wind space. And it doesn't mean we do away with the entire umbilical necessarily. Some reservoirs will require artificial lift if we can't generate enough power from perhaps wind, which we could do fixed or floating to generate artificial lift, electrical submersible pumps that reside down the well. Um, if they require that amount of power, they could be a mixture. But the saving alone, if we're burning thirty-five dollars to $50,000 worth of diesel a day in order to generate power to run a subsea host, then you can quickly add up to sort of six million OPEX saving a year by doing something slightly different. Working the circular economy thinking through this, instead of having a capital asset that you own and then you, you dispose of at the end of its useful life, you could think of power as we do at home. You know, power as a service delivery. We just pay for what we use. It could be a, a mixed um, or hybrid commercial model that then talks differently. I quite like this particular device, the BioWave device. It actually mimics seaweed on the seabed. That's, and it just from the action, as it passes, uh, the wave passes over the top, it actually moves in the same way that seaweed does. The device that we talk about a lot, one of our first projects, uh, and the, the company owners are in the room also, so I expect some questions, um, tough questions perhaps towards the end. <laughs> ECOG have their power hub system. This basically takes tidal current energy, applies it, um, stores it, manages it, and then gives it out in terms of well management system. So this can already be hooked up to well. The thing to bear in mind about when we talk about re integrating marine renewables with oil and gas is, is, I guess, twofold. When you design it to harvest power from the sea and you want to sell that commercially, then you want to have the maximum power transfer. You want the maximum power for your investment dollar. When we're doing it in oil and gas, we actually don't need the same megawatt. Size doesn't matter here. What does matter is robust, low cost, non-interactive, low maintenance. And we're talking kilowatts. You know, we're not talking megawatts in terms of what the well would require. That's an interesting insight, I think, from our point of view. Actually, I'll go back to this one. So the, this piece of equipment has already been site trialled up at EMEC up in Orkney on the, in the tidal site. We're lining up our first three clients looking to, to work a field trial with this, um, this equipment on the industrial level. It's not the only approach that we've got from a marginal fields point of view. Some fields in the southern basin gas fields primarily have an opportunity to go gas to wire. So what we mean by that is actually almost selling gas at the wellhead, generating electricity offshore, tying into the national grid via an offshore wind farm. 
So that, if you think about the existing wind farms in the UK CS, they're already there. Um, there's a massive set of infrastructure. They're not fully utilized. There's capacity, what we would call ullage, pipeline capacity in the oil and gas industry. You could think of as being um, ullage in their connector system through the inverters. So basically the power is generated offshore. We could sell the gas offshore at the wellhead, generate electricity and sell it into the national grid. There's more interconnectors that are being built and there's more wind farms planned. So imagine um, a future where it says actually we're going to have an integrated approach. We're going to integrate the energy. We're not going to plan just for that wind farm. We're going to plan for that wind farm who is also going to take power or give power to or take power from oil and gas. Totally changes the investment met metrics. There is a company um, based down um, south, Rob Hastings, the chairman, CEO. Um, Rob is former Crown Estates. They have a slightly different concept. What we were talking there was about turning gas into power, pumping it into the national grid, what we'd call normal ba you know, base load. Rob's commercial op um, opportunity is slightly different. What they're talking about is taking an existing gas infrastructure, stop, stop compressing the gas and sending it ashore. That uses, roughly speaking, a third of the gas to compress the gas to get the balance ashore, two thirds. That can extend the southern basin life in certain areas by 10 or 15 years because you're, you're getting better economic utility from the gas. You're hooking through an offshore substation. He's got a much higher power generation, 132 kV cable connecting into the offshore substation. That's an entirely different proposition. That, that's upscaling. He's now selling balanced power. You know, the, the load that the UK calls on every day to sort of balance the, the users, us as consumers, and the amount generated. A lot of that swing load at the moment comes from things like diesel. It's very high margin. Uh, and I guess Indigo's power view is that they could build a system that would ba use balanced power, be green, um, and last a lot longer. So, so it's not just wave, it's not just tide or current, it's not just wind. Um, Martin Tullock is in the room, and Martin co-presented um, with us last Friday at Subsea Expo. And again, we're looking at how we could integrate offshore wind, what would work well for us. The tie back of the future is thinking about subsea wells, one or two wells coming together. The facility future is really talking about a version of the future that people aren't going offshore in the same numbers for the same reasons. We'd rather pay people an onshore shift allowance than an offshore allowance. That's the intent there. So it's a, a low manned or an unmanned facility. There are already concepts out there for water injection lines, standalone um, windmills, if you will, offshore carrying water injection to increase efficiency and recovery factors. There's no reason at all why that couldn't be like this. In Norway, you're already required when you do a fuel development plan to consider taking power from shore, offshore, rather than generating your own offshore, clearly from a carbon footprint point of view, from a cost point of view, and a commercial imperative point of view. So I guess the question for us, do you think there is a future in integrating renewable energy with oil and gas in a different way that we consider at the moment, and if this is one version of the future that you could buy into. And I think that's it from me. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's so what, we, what we'll offer is we'll do that show of hands at the end of the Q&A session to give you the most opportunity to either lambast, challenge, disagree, with each other in the room as well as myself. But we would like a show of hands before you go, if that's okay. All right, questions? The top marks to Chris for keeping to time. <laughs> so 10 out of 10. Um, so we're just going to go into a QA and a now. So if you do have a question, raise your hand, and my colleague Lauren will approach you with the mic. Please wait for the mic to come to you, not just because it's difficult to hear questions in the room without it. Okay. So show of hands, who would like to ask a question of Chris? Hey. One at the end. <laughs> Do tell us who you are when you ask your question. Uh, Jordan Harkins, OGTC. <laughs> so I know a little bit about the facility of the future, um, but how, how close or far away do you think we are from actually seeing that <clears throat> and it being a reality? So all the kind of bits of the jigsaw coming together mm -hmm. and actually unlocking, you know, a cluster of small pools or a small pools development? 
Uh, we're, we're very close. I, I think um, w one thing that we focused on, and maybe I didn't bring out in that very short condensed presentation, we focused on technologies ready now for deployment, as well as looking to the future. So for down manning, unmanning, or being totally unmanned, um, there are already companies such as BP, Statoil, who already have their own live projects where there are no people in the facility. Those have been retrospectively engineered to be unmanned or downmanned. I think what the approach we're taking here is if you design it from the beginning, that it's going to be low um, occupancy level, and there's probably a progression to fully automated unmanned oil facility. In the southern basin, we already have unmanned um, gas facilities, and clearly we have unmanned subsea. Does that answer the question? And this gentleman over here, Lauren, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the more colourful shirt. Hi, thanks for a, a super presentation. David Roger from Shell. Uh, also spent some time in the renewables business taking the Aberdeen offshore wind farm through public consultation. So sorry, Donald, if there's any Donald supporters in the room. Uh, but um, my question is, uh, this is fantastic. Um, the point would be uh, renewables is a devolved matter for the Scottish Government and uh, oil and gas, obviously, a UK reserve matter. Have you had any early indications of a willingness to make this work from a, a policy perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're engaged with the Crown Estates, OGA, Bays. Um, we're engaged with operators in the Southern Basin, the Northern Basin. We're totally agnostic. We don't recognize any boundaries, not in our personal lives or our work lives. You know, <laughs> Everybody's stepping up and getting engaged. Did that answer your question? Good, thank you. Okay, thank you. This gentleman here, you had a question, I believe. Yes, Richard. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, Richard Gibson from Universal Pegasus. I'm actually taller sitting down than I am standing <laughs> up, so I'm going to stay here. I'm just wondering about the power being generated offshore to, uh, to stop or to, to prevent long umbilicals being laid. What happens when you need the fluids? Is somebody looking at the idea of having everything as well as the power offshore? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. Um, in the 20 minutes we've got, we've condensed it and really looked at power generation. But clearly the power that's generated could be then subsidy distribution units. There's companies around, there's technology that's there today, which looks to hook onto a standard wave, standard wellheads, and then um, put in the correct amount of either well chemicals for stimulation or into the production system for corrosion inhibiting, uh, methanol, etc. So those systems are around. Part of our projects that we're looking at and proposals and we're looking for industry support. Um, also then look at totally remote subsea sites. You can imagine it being in 1,000 or 2,000 metres of water where everything's totally remote and you've got six months supply, excuse me, of chemicals already stored effectively in carbon fibre bags, being managed remotely, wireless links, etc., to your host FPSO, for instance. So, so that technology is there, Richard, and it's um, in use. Repsol alone on one project saw a saving between three million by changing that approach going to distributed power network and going to a distributed chemical injection system. Um, Mike Waldridge, Universal Pegasus. Um, historically we've done quite a lot on wind farm side of things um, but they're always perceived from a project point of view as very much an onshore civils contract yeah. and there's a lot of animosity historically towards the offshore aspect. Um, and so really, question, I get, I think the battery's going, uh. <laughs> a similar question to really the legislative one, which is, you know, the relationship building on that side. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it is. It, it's interesting, your question, you're saying it's civil in nature, but it's confrontational in, in reality. Um, that, that's the way it goes. They use what's called blue book contracting methodologies, standard, standard stuff on when you're building a dam or a road, etc. Um, offshore contracting, in my experience, isn't always that friendly either, to be quite honest. Um, but, but we've worked out how we can collaborate together. Certainly, when you talk to the operators, bear in mind we're talking for the operators of the wind farms, not the builders of the wind farms. There's a great opportunity for them. This is an additional revenue stream. Now, this is an additional opportunity to get money through their system in some form of um, pull-through that they hadn't anticipated when they, they sort of agreed to do that project or that investment decision. Okay. When you say operator, when you say operator, do you mean an oil and gas operator or do you mean a wind network farm. grid wind operator? Because yeah. obviously, I mean, people, yeah. 
a lot of the German network operators would very much say, no, this is a civil contract. Because by law, their contracts, like the export, the export line out to the substation or the main generator is, um, is actually part of the grid infrastructure, not yeah. part of the offshore infrastructure. Yeah, which is different in the UK, as you're aware. So, so I think dealing with the operator in the UKCS, bear in mind our focus on the, on the uh, UKCS here, then yes, it is a slightly different contracting regime. Do we have to get to know each other better? For sure. Um, in the southern basin we looked at earlier, you know, some of those opportunities are entirely surrounded by wind farms. You'd have to double or triple your pipeline length to get route to market, if, unless you go to a gas-to-wire type approach. And it's not just gas-to-wire, I'd say. There's also that opportunity for wire-to-gas in terms of hydrogen. Um, you know, we, we can use our facilities offshore and extend the lines further if we want to use some of that free electricity in terms of electrolysis, for instance, and then generate hydrogen other opportunities to market. Does that answer your question? In part, if not in full? Yes. All right. Okay, do we have any more questions? Chris, oh. you in at the front here. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian Montgomery, retired uh, ExxonMobil. In terms of the overall cost of the, let's say, a typical development, mm -hmm. what percentage would you assign to the control type environment, the umbilicals, uh, yeah. etc., in the overall development, to give you an idea of what is the prize? Yeah, it's a good question, and it, it's quite a detailed question. And I have to answer it quite broadly because of the, the, the distinct geography of the, the small pools. But we would, if you want to think about it effectively as being a million, million pounds per kilometre, capital acquisition of the cost of an umbilical, a service umbilical, then obviously our view is if for the 100 fields or so that we're thinking about close proximity, early development stuff, roughly speaking 10 kilometres away from infrastructure, that's a billion pounds worth of, of capita, capex, if you will. That's not going into the opex piece, but obviously the capex piece. Having then, if you have to then obviously um, offset that against the installation costs and offset that again, offset it again against the cost of a very, um, very discreetly costed, systems such as we talked about earlier with ECOG, which could be a lease system rather than a CAPEX system. There are different views to look at it, I think, Ian. One of them is roughly a third, a third, a third, a third for the well, a third for the subsea facilities, and a third for the top size mod. You know, um, I don't know where the extra third comes in from the lawyer's fees, but they'll be in there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, you know, maybe the arithmetic's slightly off, but that's, that's what it seems to take the time at the moment. From our point of view, doing away with the umbilical or slimming it down, doing the chemical injection, having a chemical-only bundle compared to an electrohydraulic system, much, much cheaper. So that it won't be one-size-fits-all, and that's part of, I think, the discussion around the tieback of the future. It, it's, there isn't a set of silver bullets that we can fire off. There's a set of themes that we can work to that will be applicable to different subsets of the, of the asset base that's out there. Oh, thank you. A couple more, if I can. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Go <laughs> on, you've got the mic. The... Good. Yeah, Nikki's got the tight stopwatch and the controls, uh, I'll warn you now. She's ruthless. <laughs> yeah, in terms of, you know, you meant to think of remote operations. Yeah. I mean, we were operating remotely in the 70s, so yeah. there's nothing new, and it's surprising the industry hasn't quite driven forward, you know, yeah. given the time frame. Same with standardization. Mm -hmm. Standardization. Different, difficult questions always get edited, you know, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because, um, again, we looked early 70s, 80s, standard mm -hmm. trees, etc., yeah. and straight hydraulics, and developed some single well small fields yeah, yeah. just using that concept. So we're now coming full circle and saying, here we are again. Yeah. Now, how are we going to make it stick? <laughs> I'm kind of hoping the commercial imperative is what drives this one. If we show that um, low commodity price, we can still economically develop fields and make money, then that will help drive the threads of technology. And we are totally agnostic. We really aren't, aren't here to promote one thing over another. But as you can see, and I hope I've persuaded you, some of our themes do realize massive savings. If we go to a more circular economy, a, 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 an ambition that says that we will design for disassembly, not reuse, that's not really a theme that you've talked to there in, from the 70s or the 80s. We may have spent more money doing the same engineering and I'm an ex-MD of a construction business. I know that for every billion in turnover, I need 1,000 people, of which 400 to 450 are going to be engineers, the rest of the support staff. 
those metrics I can play with. I can maybe shed 10 or 20%, but to get that billion turnover, that's still what I need as ACG sub C7 or technique when we look at their numbers. That number hasn't really changed. We still spend a lot on engineering. So I think your standardization point is very key. There are huge opportunities for industry to take, but maybe some of the lawyers and the contracts people, the commercial people we talked about earlier, need to get aligned with that methodology as well. well lawyers tend to set you up to fail. <laughs> All right. Okay, Thank you. Okay, we've got time for another couple of questions. Are there anybody else that got anything for Chris? Chris? <laughs> uh, yep, Chris Bond, um, retired from AMEC. Um, everything you said sounds like it's going to fill the uh, seabed pretty thoroughly. <laughs> um, has the fishing industry said that's great? Or? Yeah, um, so strangely enough, another of our themes, um, the fishing inter interface, so one of the pieces of work we've already done is we can, and this also talks to that collaborative nature, the other question we had before about where is government and the government agencies involved. Scottish Fishermen's Federation, um, if we don't have to design for over-trawlability, there's an additional two and a half to four and a half billion saving in capital costs. It costs a lot of money to take large bits of Norway, crush them up, ship them across, and then dump them on the seabed here as rock dump. Um, we don't have to do that. The Crown Estates Office is aligned with that. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation, whether we agree with their politics or not, about what their future looks like post-Brexit, um, they see an opportunity to get fishing vessels back fishing. If we can design for disassembly, so we leave them a clean seabed at the end, rather than a bunch of hazards for their nets. Anyone who's seen any of the programs, and, and it's very um, sort of in vogue at the moment, the discussion around plastic and reuse of plastic in sea. Fishing industry sees this as an opportunity, very, very receptive. And we've approached them from the out, outset with um, the fishing um, liaison meetings. And we're already now into phase two. Um, Exodus are in the room here, who did the engineering study that looked at this. So this is not personal opinion. This is not opinion engineering. This is a, a reasoned engineering set of judgments applied across how we design things and then install them, build them, and install them on the seabed. Yeah, so it, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not closed, but it's very interesting. Okay. I should also comment that LR are taking that on to the next step. They're showing good collaboration as well. Two competing organisations handing the baton over from phase one to phase two, reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last chance for a question for Chris. Okay. Hmm? Any takers? Any questions mm -hmm. on the device itself that we've talked to, the ECOG system? <laughs> Go for this it. This guy's trouble, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm going to look at uh, and introduce Richard and Rob, who are both in the room, who are both ECOG. So feel free to ask someone else a question. Oh, no. Oh, right. <laughs> no, it's it just that I'd seen something similar for wind power. Yeah. And just wondering how Good. well that had worked for wind power compared to... Uh, conventional um, propeller-driven uh, wind, wind power design. In terms of the vertical fins? The vertical than, yeah. fins, yeah. Gentlemen, designers, would you like to comment? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so really the difference between the propeller and the sort of vertical design is that the vertical design is much more to uh, tolerant to turbulence. So if you use a, a wind turbine in like an urban environment, you'll often see a vertical axis. But in the sort of open space fields offshore, it's sort of uh, more of a horizontal axis design. So if you are to put a turbine in uh, subsea, but it can be quite turbulent, there's other things going on. It's, we've done a lot of research and found that the, um, the vertical axis is the, the way to go. And also, it's much more simpler in terms of the drivetrain. Yep. So a reliability is kind of key. It's, it's much simpler. You don't need pitch. You don't need yaw. There's a, there's a kind of number of reasons why the mm -hmm. vertical axis kind of suits the subsea environment. Reasoned engineering design. Yeah, excellent. I, if we're close to wrap up, can I take a straw poll and just ask you to raise your hands again? Do you think there's a commercial imperative to integrate renewable energy with oil and gas? Thank you. Does anybody not think there is? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We Extra like a challenge. Convenient. We like a challenge. Okay, right. so that's us pretty much wrapping up for today. 
So I guess we've heard a little bit about a lot of different things that Chris has uh, told us today, around the circular economy, around our small pools, around renewables, a piece about ECOG, facility of the future and tie back of the future, and some bad jokes, and a little bit more about you than sometimes Those we need to. So it's just, just another day at the OGTC.